Good morning. Welcome back to Sober Social. I have not been 100% upfront and honest with you all. I haven't been dishonest and I'm very grateful, very proud to be able to say that. But um, there's just some things on my chest that I really want to get out there. I, was, I sort of had it in the back of my mind that I would trickle them out as, I, as the channel progressed and as it grew. But I think it's just much smarter that I get it all out of my chest right now in, in this two-part series video called Confessions. And I do have some real confessions. It wasn't clickbait. I promise you're in for a real treat. So I'm just going to open up and my hope is that it will make it more real to you. It will show you exactly who you're learning from, where I'm at socially. I don't want to come across like a guru or like, a, like, an, uh, like, an, like an aspiring guru or like a, you know, like a scam artist of types. I want to be very honest and I just want to lay it all out on the table and then those videos will just be there for you to reference whenever you want. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to talk about my story. It's going to go, I'm going to go not like hella deep into my past, but I'm just going to give you the relevant points when it comes to this channel, my struggles sort of uh, elsewhere, not, not necessarily social, but social as well, but elsewhere so that we can get a context for who I am and a lot of the things that I've struggled with. Uh, and then, you know, that, how that made me who I am. I'm then going to talk about some struggles that I've gone through, some growing pains that I've had and then my current position which will come in the next video but that I hope will you know really it'll really excite you as it excites me because the current position is so much stronger than it's been in a long time and then of course the current position with that comes prospects for the future my plans for the for this channel my visions for this brand and uh, so I just I, I'm really excited about that the sections of this video are as follows the first thing we're going to discuss is my decision not to drink, why I decided to, to make that a part of my identity, how it came about. And then I'm going to talk about my social experiences from the past, specifically emphasizing my social naivety back in the day. <laughs> and then that, I hope, again, just all about relatability, making it more relatable for you, showing you that I'm no expert. And even now, as much as I've grown, there's still so many things that I would love to learn. And there's just, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement. There always will be. But, you know, you're going to get a very good look at who I am and, and where I was before. And then I'm going to talk about my online awakening, discovering all of the opportunity that awaited me online. And that then leading into the final section of this first part of the Confessions series, which is my tensions with my family that inevitably arose because of the, the differing paradigms, you know, after discovering the opportunity online, comparing that with the traditional narrative and that part I think of the video was it's just gonna really speak to a whole bunch of you it's gonna be very relatable very exciting so without any any further ado let's get right into it and begin with my decision not to drink Go ahead and adjust my imaginary tie here. Okay. <laughs> Let's begin. So why is it that I don't drink alcohol? You can see my, my beautiful water bottle here. I take it pretty much everywhere with me. Inclu well, no, I'm not including the bars, but uh, I do the reason that that like came to mind initially is because I do drink water at the bars. It's kind of funny sometimes. But anyway, the reason that I don't drink primarily is just logical. And I think when a lot of people first discover that I don't drink alcohol, they probably assume that it's a moral thing. If it is that, then it's a very, very minute part of the reason. It could be the case, but it's just the vast majority of the reason that I don't drink is logical. And that's the case, even though I am Christian, and I think that if someone were to discover that um, in parallel with the, the, the fact that I don't drink, they'd probably assume that it had something to do with my religion. Not at all. I haven't been Christian as long as I've been a teetotaler, which is kind of cool, actually. But uh, anyway, yeah, very much primarily logical. Um, I've always associated alcohol with foolish behavior, and this is probably because of a particular family member of mine. I won't disclose that identity. But it, it just, you know, I saw a lot of just not attractive things. And um, that was both when the individual was sober 
as well as you know drink, drinking because I felt like the reason that he or she, <laughs> I'm being very careful not to give away any information about this individual, um, <laughs> that was because my interpretation was the reason that they were even drawn to alcohol in the first place was because they had low self-esteem and that showed in their sober behavior as well as their their drunk behavior you know and so that really turned me away from alcohol I also understood of course that alcohol is dangerous it's a poison for God's sake and I, it just never really made sense to me I understood of course the whole like cell of it's fun it, it lubricates socializing it makes it easier more loose and all that that really never sold me because I understood even though Alcohol probably makes social interaction easier, it like lubricates the whole social playing field. I knew that it was just on the surface. It was like, you know, it might make your social skills better on the surface. It might make it easier while you're under its influence. But as soon as you take that influence away, you're not any better at socializing than you were before. You know, you don't have any actual developed confidence that would have taken the actual hard work instead of just taking this kind of shortcut you know and so to anyone that says that sobriety is boring what I would tell them is that it's not sobriety that's boring it's you my friend <laughs> it's you that is boring so confession time confession one do you remember from my very first sober social video where I uh, I claimed, I, I don't remember what I said, I'll just put it here. I don't drink alcohol. I am a teetotaler, 100% since I was born. I, I <laughs> well, that was not exactly correct. Did you, did you notice how I hesitated? <laughs> there are actually two occasions where I have consumed alcohol. I know, right? Gasp! I have actually drank alcohol. However, um, before I go ahead and tell you about these two occasions where I did consume alcohol, I'm going to be, I'm going to kind of give myself credit for the fact that I, even though I have drank alcohol on two occasions in my life, neither of those occasions did I actually get to the point where I've felt the effects of alcohol. So I can honestly say I've never actually felt the effects of alcohol. I've never put on a buzz, much less put on a full drunkenness or like been, you know, gone and blacked out or had a hangover or anything like that. I've, I've just had these two occasions. So here they are. The first one's not that exciting. It's just, you know, I was at an old Chicago. I was with my dad and he had a beer. He had ordered a beer with uh, the lunch or whatever. And um, I don't, I'm not sure if he offered or if I requested, but I tasted it. I had a sip absolutely excruciating I could not stand this the, the, the smell even much less the taste and so yeah that was the first experience that was probably when I was like nine or ten years old the second one's actually a little bit more interesting and that's because for my 13th birthday my mother my, my beloved mother she took me to another continent for <laughs> my 13th birthday I know right pretty pretty crazy so she took me to England and on that vacation, we took this thing called the Eurostar. This is a train. It's like a subway that goes underwater from England to France. I'm not sure if it has other destinations as well, but we went from England to Paris. We were in London. We went all the way to Paris, and um, we visited the Eiffel Tower, uh, and it was just an amazing experience. And so while we were at the Eiffel Tower, we had lunch, and because France doesn't have a drinking age, or at least they didn't at the, at the time, uh, they offered me wine with lunch and so it was just it was very like a like a win in Rome type situation you know so my mom she was a little bit reluctant but she you know she understood the vibrations of of the, the French community and my dad of course was all for it and so it was it was just a kind of a cool situation and I understood that I wasn't gonna get um, I, I, it was a very unique situation that it wasn't going to come around every day. And so, you know, I, I just kind of, I was like, you know what, I'm in Paris. I'm 13 years old. I'm probably not going to be back here for quite a while, if ever. I still haven't been to another, another well, yeah, I still haven't been to another continent since that trip. And so, yeah, that was the second time I consumed alcohol. I had maybe like a quarter of the glass of wine or whatever. I'm, I'm not really sure, but 13 years old, I... Uh, that's, that was the, the last time that I consumed alcohol, and that I 
Cross my heart, swear to God, I never consumed alcohol since that day. And I'm, I'm very proud <laughs> to be able to say that, even though I've been, I've had temptresses come, come to my door before. So, uh, yeah, I, that's, that's, the, that's the last of it. And then the next, the next section we're going to go into my social naivety of the past. So we're going to go all the way back to my high school days. <laughs> and this is, this is going to be fun. Um, I was a skater kid back in the day. And that will show, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see me sometimes. I still skateboard. I, I do love to skateboard still. And um, it, I, I think it's a great, you know, it's just a great, like, little toy to have in the back of my car at all times in case I just, you know, and a man, you know, a wise man once told me, Sometimes a man just needs to get away. I, I really hope that he watches this video because he'll know who it is. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I was a skater kid back in the day. I was never popular, not very, I wasn't ever popular. I wasn't very social. I, uh, I, I, I kind of viewed it as I was in my little clique. We had our skater crew and then there was like the prep kids and then there was the, there was the like athlete kids and they kind of maybe hung out with each other or whatever. I don't know. You know, I, I didn't pay attention much because I believed that there was this certain line that you just didn't cross. You know, it was like this unwritten rule that you weren't supposed to talk to those kids. And that was it. That, it was, it, I, I didn't, I never thought about it very deeply. I just, I believed that that was the case. I wasn't, I'm not sure if that was an assumption of mine or if that was just because of some conditioning that I went through or what, but that was what I believed. However, at the same time, I was never envious, and I think this is important to mention because I, I think that if you're in a position where you believe that you're sort of the outcast or you believe you're nerdy or loser or whatever, um, like I sort of was, I wasn't ever like an extreme outcast, but I, you know, I was sort of like in that outcast crew. Um, it's important that you're not envious. It's important that you're not hateful towards those people, and I never was, and that, that's that's not the like you know, put superior or moral superiority upon myself. It's just a mention that for whatever reason, I just never had that bone in my body. I wasn't, I wasn't ever like, you know, fuck that guy and fuck that girl, you know, because they, they don't, they don't, they won't hang out with me. It's like, I was never like that. So, however, <laughs> and this, you know, after just, after just patting myself on the back, I'm going to now come out with the second confession, which is a girl, I'm not going to give her real name. We're just going to call her Vanessa. Um, she almost certainly will never watch any of my videos, so it probably wouldn't matter anyway. But anyway, Vanessa, this was my first kiss. And um, needless to say, it was very, very emotional. I had no understanding of boundaries which, or non-neediness, which I talked about in a previous video. I had no understanding of that. I had no understanding of what it meant to be attractive. I, I just thought that I needed to answer to her requests in order to keep her with me. I thought that I had to like, you know, serve and serve and serve and serve and serve, even though she pretty much treated me like shit. Um, and I thought that that's how it worked. I, I really didn't know any better. Um, so I was very desperate very needy with this girl and uh, poor girl you know I, I i felt bad for myself at the time but now i look back and i'm like damn you know i i uh i was so like i, I was desperate and needy and yet she continued to text me you know even if it wasn't like right away and she kind of played games and stuff like that she still like you know she gave me attention she 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 played that game and i just i feel like i could have been such such a better such a better guy for her but anyway, you know, it was back in the day before I learned. So anyway, it's just a very, very confusing time in my life. And that's just one girl. There's others, but that was the most extreme example, certainly, by far. Um, and now, I guess the next, the next thing that I want to say is the reason that I was like that, the reason that I had no understanding, the reason that I was so desperate for her approval, for her attention towards me and her acceptance of me, I believe, my, my philosophy, is that I was simultaneously, the same period of my life where I was struggling with this, I was also very, very desperate. I was chasing daddy's approval. <laughs> and I, um, 
that was painful too. You know, it was a very similar dynamic for a long time. It's changed now, but um, yeah, it was it was a similar dynamic where my dad would like push me. You know, he had the best he had the best interest at heart, but he would push me to do things that I I really didn't want to do. Like I, I remember like student senate and cross country. And to be fair, I was probably a little bit of a shit back in the day. I was probably like stubborn I, I know I, I still am stubborn with a lot of things um, but yeah you know I, I just he pushed those things and I at that time felt like I was doing my best to meet those expectations and it was just never enough and so I, I really I'm, I'm trying not to I'm trying my best not to like talk shit on my dad it just that's the way it felt at the time that was the dynamic and that I think played into my my complete naivety when it came to this girl this girlfriend of mine or this girl that like happened to give me some attention I don't really know if we ever dated or whatever but anyway now to wrap up with another con confession or a couple of confessions these are gonna be this is <laughs> it's it uh, like makes me a little bit nervous in my chest just just considering them but I, I promised you some confessions so here we go these are a couple of embarrassing stories and these actually both happened after high school. I think they both happened in college. Um, but nonetheless, I, I want to share them with you here. The first one, I was at a party. Both of these are actually at parties. The, the first one I was at a party, and um, I, having like come to college with all of those expectations, you know how there's like this stigma around the college experience where it's just like a lot of booze and a lot of sex, and the girls are all very like um, open to that I guess and it was just like you know like have you ever seen Blue Mountain State it's like that you know that stigma was in my head and I, so when I went to these parties I kind of had that in my mind and um, I, I didn't really get that you had to also be capable of talking to people you had to be aware of social dynamics you had to be able to like you know approach girls and approach people and make friends and I, I had no understanding of any of that. Again, I wasn't like a complete loser in high school. I know it, I'm probably painting it like that so far. I had my little group of friends but I just, I never ever ever branched out and actually like expressed myself forward to meeting new people. And so when I got to college and I had like mostly left my, my skater friends behind because unfortunately a lot of them didn't have as much ambition as I did. Um, I I was lost. I didn't I didn't get it. Okay, so uh, anyway, I, I'm at this party, right? And I don't talk to anybody. I think I actually went with a friend. I don't really remember, but I, I uh, there's this girl, and I notice that she and her her friend her her girlfriend are waiting for a safe ride uh, here in Laramie that's just like a like a taxi that's free because it's to you know prevent um, drunk driving so I noticed they they like talk about that or they maybe they give the call or whatever I noticed that and without introducing myself without saying hi without you know probably seeing her like throughout the night but never talking to her at all never never probably talking to most of the other people I go over and I ask her if she wants a ride I mean the best. I'm truly like I, you know, I don't. I'm not drinking, obviously, and so I mean the best. I'm like, okay, well, maybe this is, uh, maybe this is how you like make friends or or like get a date or you know what the other things that I'm talking about. But you know, I I thought maybe that's how you went about it because I was like, well, I'm I'm I don't drink and and I was told that it's gonna be really cool when you get to college and you can be the DD for everybody all the time and that you know everybody's gonna love you for that. And so I, I did it. I, I offered this girl a ride, and of course, she was like, uh, no. <laughs> she fucking got grossed out, or like creeped out, and I don't, I don't blame her. I, at the time, it was very confusing, um, and I think even at the time, she kind of noticed, you know, the, how like struck I was with, with amazement that she was so creeped out. Uh, so she, she probably showed me a little bit of pity, but it definitely did not, you know, let me take her home, or drive her and her friend home. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it for that one. Here is another, <laughs> my God, I have to give another one. Here's another very embarrassing story. I was at another party. I think, I, I think I went with a friend this time too, a, a, a girlfriend of mine that I met at another party, I think. And I, I'm not 
you know, th there's, a, a, you know, there's, a, there's good experiences too, but um, this is all about the confessions. So, I'm at this party, and I end up in the basement somehow. I think the girlfriend and her, um, her boyfriend, because she's not my girlfriend. She's just a friend, like a female friend, you know. And her boyfriend are upstairs. So I'm in the basement, and I'm very anxious because there's people dancing upstairs, and I, I, I don't understand. I don't. I don't feel inclined. I'm just very like, whoa, you know, overstimulated. And so I, I end up in the basement where there's like no people. And I remember I, I stood over in this corner and I get on my phone just to like escape, you know. And I'll, I'll t talk about this in other videos. Uh, not me personally, but that phenomenon of escaping through the phone. So that's where I'm at. I'm on my phone doing whatever. And I'm just like standing in the corner and I'm, I'm, even though I'm on my phone, probably the majority of my attention is in my head, thinking about like what I'm doing there, why the f fuck I came to this party, or just why I'm like so stifled. And um, I'm standing there, and this guy comes down the stairs, probably to like use the bathroom or whatever. He has a drink in hand, and he passes me before noticing me. And then he kind of like looks to the left, and he notices me. And he's like, what the fuck? Or who the fuck? <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, like, whoa, like, uh, you know, I, I didn't mean to startle you. And he's like, um, I, 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 I think I, I said uh, something like, oh, yeah, you know, just, just like taking a break from the, from the chaos or something like that, you know. And he's like, you're hella creeping, dude. And he, he meant it lighthearted. And he like gave a laugh, but he's like, you're hella creeping, dude. Like very honest, like you look very not, you know, not friendly, not safe, you know, and this is so, anyway, that's, that was another, another very embarrassing time, so let's, whew, let's give myself a break, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and transition now, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break here, so I can show you a, a funny project that I worked on back in school, that I, I hope will give you a laugh, and then we'll go ahead and break back into the rest of the, the uh, points for this first part of the confession series. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I hope you enjoyed that. That was a <laughs> that was a project that I worked on for a psychology class back in high school that I just find so funny for some reason. So we're about halfway through now, and what I want to go into now is my online awakening, which is all about a turning point in my life and the opportunities, I mean, I highlight some opportunities that I believe were so powerful with planting seeds that were, they were the seeds that finally made it so that I could begin c cultivating that self-direction and self-confidence within myself. Because up to this point, what I've been trying to convey to you with the whole, you know, like the social naivety section, um, the misconceptions that I had in high school of like believing I wasn't necessarily supposed to talk to the more popular kids 
and my issues, my struggles, and the pain, and the confusion, the desperation, the neediness with Vanessa, chasing my father's approval, and then of course the embarrassing stories, it's all been hand-picked to illustrate to you that I was naive, first of all, <laughs> very naive socially, um, but more core than that, I had a lack of belief in myself. I had a lack of, like, I didn't have a story that I could point to and say, this is the story that I've chosen, and I want to go ahead and, and follow that story for myself and make it work my own way. And because I didn't have that, I felt like I was very dependent on the story that my parents had already kind of written for me um, in order to feel like I was likely to be a success. And if I didn't, you know, like I could, I could go ahead and choose not to, you know, not to listen to that story, but the trade-off would be that if I didn't, you know, if I didn't meet their expectations, if I didn't submit to their uh, requests and, and demands, then I was likely to fail, or at least that's how I felt. So what this section is all about, I'm going to share with you three very core opportunities that I found all online. Um, and of course, I'm going to go into like the details of what exactly each one offered me, the values and the hope and all that. But what I want you to really take away, less than the actual details, is just the fact that these opportunities were more than just an opportunity, or more than just an education or educations of the mind. It wasn't just about learning how to make money on, in my own way and like in a more free way. Again, I'm going to go into this later, but it wasn't just about like making money better or, or getting better at socializing, get, getting better at making friends and making girlfriends or dates or you know anything like that. Or with the last one, um, I don't even know if I've mentioned the opportunities. That, let, let, let's just go into it. The first opportunity is trading which uh, I, I came across in December 2015, this game of day and swing trading stocks, mostly stocks. Uh, Cole Approach Socializing, which is another game that I, I found tremendous value in the principles as well as the practice. And then Digital Marketing and Entrepreneurship, which is of course what I'm doing with you right now. So the details of each one and what each one offered me as far as hope and, and like awe uh, inspiration and all that. Trading offered me everything that you could want and love in a job, trading had. You work your own hours, you, you, know, you work as often or as not often as you want, you can work on days that you want, you can take as much time off as you want, it's completely up to you because you have no boss, you have no overhead, so it's completely up to you. You can work from anywhere in the world, so long as you have an internet connection. And then the most important thing for me was the fact that it was scalable. It was a scalable way to make money. And I knew, like I, I understood the power of compounding, and I knew that there was probably, there probably had to be opportunities for um, you know, compounding earnings potential rather than just linear, which is pretty much what you're going to find in the employment narrative, no matter what. I mean, I haven't ever found any different. So that, those were all the very core pieces of the puzzle that I thought, you know, I, I, because this was the first opportunity I really came across online um, that was that opportune, I thought that I knew that that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I thought I wanted to be a trader for sure and I was going to make it work no matter what. I was completely determined. Later though, I actually discovered that there's a very, very core piece of the puzzle um, that was missing, and, and when I say that, I mean there's a very, there's a very like what I believe is very necessary to it, just being a human being. There's a very necessary component of fulfilling work that was missing in trading, and I'm going to get to that later. But so let's let's go on to the next one now, which is cold approach socializing. This game, the community that I came across, their whole game. I mean, you know, the, the name of this cold approach socializing is basically what it is, but it's like they, it's, it's a community where guys particularly, but I guess, you know, girls are, some girls are interested in it too. They actively push themselves to go out into uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable for them, and they, uh, 
they push themselves to approach strangers and move those situations into favorable outcomes, into win-win outcomes. You know, it's not just about, it's not at all actually about win-lose. It's not about manipulation or anything like that. It's about collaboration. It's, a, it's learning to feel, to me, it was always about learning to feel comfortable and accepted, like I belonged in certain environments, especially for me, like a big one for me was the bars, you know, because I don't drink and I always felt very out of place whenever I went to a bar. Now that's not the case anymore, at least not with bars that I've been to before. Maybe that that would change if I went to a new one, but, you know, because I'm still working on myself. But anyway, they actively push themselves to, to face those fears. And along with that whole journey, there comes a bunch of values that are also taught, you know, separate from the practice as principles themselves. And that's, so that's what I want to go into now. In cold approach socializing, I already talked about, I already kind of mentioned the, the actively facing your fears. Kind of like cold showers where you're, you know, you're, you're actively, you're consciously choosing to expose yourself to that discomfort in order to um, up your willpower and whatever other benefits there are. Just like with that, when you actively go out and regularly approach new people and you're practicing making new friends, getting more or uh, more quality intimate relationships or maybe business connects or whatever else, you're, or, or, you know, it could just be that you're like having fun in social in environments. When you're facing your fears regularly, that's not just going to reduce and trump your approach anxiety. It's also going to make it so that you're more able when you feel afraid to go ahead and do it anyway, you know, because it's not like you just get rid of your fear and then you can go and do whatever it is. You have to b realize that the fear is a necessary, it's, I wouldn't say necessary, but it's, I, I'm not even sure if I'm comfortable saying that it's an inevitable part, but just for the sake of the video, let's just go ahead and say it's an inevitable part of any journey that's worthwhile taking. And instead of trying to get rid of it before going out and just doing it, you learn to feel it and then just go ahead and do it anyway. And that's a beautiful value that I got from this game. In addition to that, and it goes hand in hand, when you go out and you expose yourself to the risks that are involved with this domain or with this uh, adventure, this game, just like with others, it's inevitable that it's not always going to go your way. You know, there's going to be rejections and so when you expose yourself to that willingly, again, just like the cold shower thing, and you kind of like realize, you see that you got it, you got to the other side and nothing really bad happened, you made it out okay, and it wasn't really as big of a deal as it might have seemed before, you desensitize yourself to the pain of that rejection. And so again, just like with the facing your fear and the, the cold shower thing, that will naturally trickle into other areas of your life so that if you're like a salesman, for example, and you have a rejection streak where just door after door after door is just like be getting slammed in your face, if you've desensitized yourself to that pain because you're playing this game, you can, you know, the next door, you can continue to have that smile on your face and the confidence within yourself and the confidence that you're actually selling a product or a service of value, you'd have that confidence because you've desensitized yourself to that pain and therefore your, your results are likely to be better and more consistent. And so that's another very important um, value that I pulled from this community. The next one is leadership. And with this, I'm going to also say forward expression. To me, what leadership means and, and where, you know, like this community and elsewhere, but particularly this community, taught me how and, and like the importance of making decisions and making decisions without being afraid of it not always like without being afraid that you're going to make a mistake every once in a while and without necessarily concerning yourself with the approval or disapproval of others whether they accept it or whether they like you or whatever doing it and moving forward with full force regardless of what when anyone has to say about it and not questioning your every move, not being hesitant, like making a decision, so-called decision, but then like being real adam, like real, like I don't know what the word is, but just being real like nervous and kind of you know shaky at the reactions of others because you're so concerned with what they have to say about it. You let that go and you just 
move forward. And uh, kind of like with uh, non evenness and boundaries, it's almost ironic when you move forward with full force and you actively like lead people, you know, it, it's not about manipulation, it's not about deception, it's about basically you're showing people that you're doing cool shit, that you're living a cool ass life, and you're a cool person, and you're going to do that regardless of what, what anyone else has to say about it, naturally that attracts people to go ahead and follow you. They're, they're literally like, they are grateful, they appreciate that you're taking charge, and that you're so clear in your desires and in your intent, and naturally they want to be around that. They just kind of want to be a part of your story, and they are allowed to, so long as they don't act up, you know, because again, we have those boundaries, we have those rules, those standards for the people that we allow into our lives and all that. So very, very important principle and I, I already spoke on the forward expression. So let's go ahead and, and go into the last opportunity that I want to discuss, which is what I'm doing with you right now, the digital marketing and entrepreneurship game. And this, this opportunity I felt really completed my education. Everything came full circle. And of course, that's not to say I'm not going to continue learning I'll always until the very day that I die. I'm going to continue to learn and grow and work and, and love and share and express and, you know, but I completed the circle as far as I realized, like I said in, earlier with the trading thing, that there was a missing piece that, oh, I, I don't know if I, I gave you the piece. So here it is. What I finally discovered was that even though trading offered all those cool things, and it was such a fun game too. I mean, I, I treat it, I view it a lot like poker. It's like, a, it's very similar, there's a lot of parallels. And it's a lot of fun. There was a missing piece that I think is very necessary to finding fulfilling work, which is what I, I find this right now. And that is contribution. With trading, the way that you make money, unlike most other ways that you make money, there's no opportunity to actually create value and then share that with the marketplace. In, it, at least the game that I play, it was really just like, you kind of like wait for emotional excess. So people are getting like super excited or they're like super afraid. And then they basically like metaphorically, of course it doesn't actually happen like this, but metaphorically basically what it is is they're like throwing their money and you just kind of have to like, at least you just kind of keep your cool, you can accept that money. And then there's like a whole bunch of caveats with that game. So it sounds easy, I, I think, probably when I describe it like that. But the, the point that I'm making here is that that, though fun, it's not fulfilling, you know, because I'm not actually creating and sharing love. I'm not like expressing myself forward like I talked about in the last opportunity. I'm not creating value and sharing that with the marketplace. So this digital marketing entrepreneurship game, it came full circle, it offered me that contribution opportunity. And at, from that point, you know, I told you it was just a seed, all of these things were just kind of seeds of, of self-confidence and self-direction. From the decision, from the like education of the overview of digital marketing and entrepreneurship, I then had to discover what exactly I wanted to do with it. I thought, I think that I knew for, since the beginning, you know, from discovering it, that I, I wanted to teach. I just wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to teach. And so we're gonna go into those struggles um, later, but not next section, I don't think. But anyway, let's, let's, this is, that's uh, good enough for the online awakening section. Let's go ahead and move on now to the final section, my tensions with my family. All right, last section of the first part, at least. Before going into the points here with, of you know, the tensions with my family, I'm gonna first read you an actual journal entry that I have from this kind of period in my life. And what I'm hoping to uh, give you, what I'm hoping to illustrate is sort of my attitude towards my family and my attitude towards the opportunities and the struggle that I was going through, the emotions involved, and um, you know, like this, this journal entry in specific, I was trying to determine exactly what it was that bothered me so much about my family and their like rejection of, of my, my ambition. And then I kind of finish up with giving myself, like trying to convince myself 
to make a change and, and start prioritizing my own heart instead of their approval. So here we go. I think the problem I have with my family is that I'm expected to perform a role in their narrative. It feels like I'm expected to behave according to who I'm with and my relationship to them. Perhaps that's not necessary. I just want to be me. I don't want to be who I'm made out to be by my parents my, or my grandparents' desires of me. I don't care about being a good student. I don't care to upkeep any kind of fake respect or admiration for my father. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> my father, though open-minded, doesn't seem to be interested in learning my full potential. He expects me to settle, as he did, for a pre-structured and well-defined narrative. My father's a military man. Having never gone his own way, how could he possibly understand the importance of doing so? <sighs> I'm sick of feeling stuck in roles I don't give a fuck about. I don't want to be the honor student. I don't want to be expected to always give the best gifts. I understand that it might sound a little bit silly for me to be so emotionally resistant to those labels. The honor student thing, the reason that that bothered me, I kind of, I came from high school not doing tremendously um, academically, at least in the later years of my high school experience. And then I went to college and I made the decision to reinvent myself and I did fantastic academically, but I did it for my own reasons, which is, it really made it very easy. And then, you know, of course, with the elevated performance came elevated expectations from my family. And that's why I was like so frustrated, like, don't call me the honor student, okay? I don't want this path. I just want a good education. That's what I went to college for. And I, you know, I, of course, I, I was very uh, disappointed with it, unfortunately, but I still did, you know, very well because I'm also kind of a perfectionist. But anyway, and then this whole... Uh, always gives the best gifts thing. This is just like a silly little example, but it, it was, you know, it did, it did hurt. It, it was like, I did get angry. Um, what it was, was I gave a gift to a family member of mine and she said, um, oh, Xander, you always give the best gifts. And, and she meant it as a compliment, but I just, I was so annoyed because I was like, I don't want to be expected to always give the best gifts. Okay, I have all these expectations already. Please don't give me any more expectations. Or, or get like have any more expectations for me uh, yeah so let's go ahead and continue I'm sick of performing for others that's why I'm excited to graduate that's why I'm so desperate for self-sufficiency if I don't rely on anyone else I won't drive myself crazy trying to sustain their image of me I can just be me weird insane, rugged and all. I, I just kind of go into more notes about knowing myself and I ask if I, if I need, if it's necessary uh, or if it's like, if I should, or if I can know myself while continuing to play this game of like, you know, this masquerade of what, is what I felt like of being the good student and, you know, answering to the call and all that. Um, more notes about whether or not it's necessary. Some notes on enlightenment and, and like, the relation. Uh, And then I say, I, the last little thing that I'll kind of censor here is that um, I'm basically going into how I don't think it's necessary that I play the role, that I play that game of like being fake, feeling like I have to be fake in order to practice these things I really do care about, which are from that last section, the whole opportunities, practicing authenticity, um, Practicing socializing, prioritizing people, particularly new people, and actually being curious about them. And of course, you know, like I, I, it's just re reinstating the same thing, which is reinforcing my social capability. 
And then I say at the very last here, I say, actively doing things I know are good for me will solidify self-confidence and make authenticity even easier. Stellar academic performance is no excuse. And I actually underline that. And the reason, I know that, again, it sounds kind of silly, but basically what I'm trying to tell myself, I'm trying to convince myself, like, dude, there is something calling you there's, there's something that your heart is longing for, and you see the opportunity. You see the potential there yourself. And so the fact that you're basically using your good grades and the, the reputation around that, like being a good college student and then getting the degree, the fact that you're using that as, ex as an excuse to neglect the calls of your heart is not okay. And that's, that's the attitude I have here. And then finally I say, learning how to love and just be who I really am is far more important to me. I hope you enjoyed that. Now we're going to go into the sections here, and then at, before we wrap up, I'll, I'll read you one more journal entry from, uh, from that period of my life. But first, let me just kind of talk about the situation, the whole dynamic. The very first thing I want to mention is probably going to be very obvious, very relatable to you. I'm, I'm sure tons of you have experienced this yourself. When I came across those opportunities that I discussed in the last section, it's not surprising that I naturally became very disillusioned with the college narrative being basically shoved down my throat. I saw basically a world-class education, world-class educations in fact, and even more than that, I saw so many of them that I had a tough time even picking which ones I wanted to prioritize and really go down and, and commit to in depth. And I saw all of them for a fraction of the cost of what it, could, of what it cost to go to college. And so, of course, you know, I was very disillusioned with the college narrative. And then with that, you know, simultaneously, I have my family who is very adamant they are very committed to the college narrative. They've you know, been brought up on it, and it was probably correct in their age, and things have changed so quickly that they just, couldn't, they just could not let go of those values, you know, that have been those beliefs that have been reinforced for literally decades. And so you have my college disillusionment, their outdated paradigm, or at least what I would say is outdated. It's, you know, they, they might disagree, but it's, it's not... <laughs> it's no secret that there's a ton of ways to make money online now and it doesn't take a college degree to get it. Anyway, those two facts led to the conflict. I was very, I was very like, I wanted so badly to go down this path of, of opportunity that I saw so, so much of and for such a like bargain and they wanted me to commit to their, or like, you know, stay with the whole thing that they were committed to. And so whenever I tried to bring in conversation about the opportunities I discussed in the last section, they never were able to see enough to be able to actually entertain the actual opportunity there. And instead what they felt was not that I was like genuinely interested in getting them on board and, and you know, just like looking for love and support. Instead, what they felt was attack. They thought that I was disrespecting them, that I was not grateful for all the sacrifices that they had made to put me through college. And that's never what it was. I was just telling them, like, look, there's something better. You know, if, I, if you really want what's best for me, which of course they do, I know that they do. If you really want what's best for me, let me show you that there's something better. And that's why, you know, because they just couldn't get it, it felt... I know that this is probably a mistake on my part, but what it felt like always was that they wanted me to just settle for mediocrity. They wanted me to settle for secure income, a secure job, a secure life, and I felt like that was them refusing to actively support my, the, the realization of my fullest potential. And so it was very painful, and it still is to this day. You know, it's not like this is completely resolved. Um, and so, you know, now I've 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 gotten more into things like religion, to so I can 
lean on the Lord and I have more faith that way because even now with the whole I've, I've discussed in depth uh, the boundaries and the self-direction and the non-neediness and everything I've, I've like make the I've obviously made the decision to not um, necessarily go down the employment route that they wanted me to go down I'm, I'm doing this entrepreneurship thing and you know still trading and all that I've had to take the position of like, I don't really care if you guys approve of it or not. I'm going to do this. I'm going to chase my dreams and I'm going to make it work. Even though I've done that, it's still, it's still tough. You know, it's still, it, it's painful to, I, I, I still like, I, uh, I talk to my family every once in a while about what I'm doing and they don't, they're not trying to be hurtful, but it's very, very difficult for them to actually believe in the potential of this kind of thing. And, and so, you know, every time I talk to them, it's basically doubt, 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 doubt. And it's, it's hard to keep going and go with full force and, and love and, and commitment and actually have faith in the ability of me and my own ability to make it work without that. And that's like what I, what I said, why I have to, you know, <laughs> lean, on, lean on something larger. So, uh, to wrap up, the last thing I want to say, from the last section, those opportunities, and remember how I said the seed of self-confidence and self-direction, I, I started to feel a sense, of, uh, a sense of those, but I also became more courageous over time as I became more, I, I gained more expertise in each of those, those educations, each of those opportunities and I had more and more practice with them. I, I gained more courage, and so my junior year of college, about halfway through, I threatened to drop out. And so I want to read you the notes from that period of my life. And yeah, let's just jump right in. Saturday, February 18th, 2017. I'm seriously considering making the decision to drop out of college. It sounds crazy, <laughs> even to me, but I can't help but to think I'm throwing away my time every moment I'm not chasing my dreams. My motivation to drop out isn't impulsive, nor is it immature or unfounded. I'm not trying to become a rapper <laughs> or a soccer player or a drug dealer. My ultimate goal is to become self-sufficient. And what I mean here is that the, my whole plan, what I have in mind is my, my trading. That's, remember, that's my, my, that initial commitment is what I thought I wanted. My heart is screaming with desire, and I ignore it simply, oh, excuse me, I ignore it by staying in school simply because that is what is expected of me. My mother, my nana, her husband, my father, my siblings, my cousins, my peers, friends of family, all expect me to continue to do what's working. My stellar transcripts were easy not because I'm smart, but because I was motivated. I didn't cross that. Don't care about grades. I don't care about a professional reputation. I don't care to become marketable. My burning desire is to become self-sufficient, to teach myself through reading, observing, and doing. The what-ifs aren't relevant. It's not a question of if I'll be able to make it work. I need only to want it more than anything else. I cannot allow myself to treat it like a should anymore. I've come to a point in my life where it's become a must. I could be the best goddamn trader there ever was. <laughs> I just have to want it more than the next guy. I don't doubt myself. I can and will create the life I've envisioned for myself while it's still clear and burning in my heart. The risk is a price I'm willing to pay. I'm going to drop out. <sighs> so, <laughs> You heard my attitude towards trading at that time. That's obviously, that's changed since then. Um, and, but then you also heard my conclusion, I'm going to drop out. 
after that journal entry, shortly after that journal entry, I went to my family and I, I told them of my plans. And there's a lot of like conversation, a lot of conflict that went down, but at the end of it all, long story short, an arrangement was made. And basically what happened was my family offered me a deal that was designed to incentivize me to continue and finish out college. And if I accepted the deal, then I would reap the benefits. And if I didn't uh, finish college, then I would be sacrificing those perks. And so that is where we're going to leave off for this first part of the confession series. And in the next video, I'm going to share with you the exact terms of that deal, what was offered, whether or not I accepted it, whether or not I dropped out, and then, of course, the rest of the story, you know, of my, my bringing up, the struggles, and, you know, coming all the way full circle to where I'm at now, both socially and otherwise, and my plans for the future of this brand and everything else. But I guess probably just this brand. <laughs> but we'll, we'll find out next video. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me. I know that this was a longer video, but I hope that you gained a ton of value from it. I feel like you, I, or I hope that you feel like you know me a little bit better. I hope I, that you feel like you've seen some other sides of me and, and feel like you can you know, relate to me on some level. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I really appreciate that you guys are still here and I'm, I can't wait to see you in the next one.